On March 1st, 2000, John Price, a well-respected man in Aberdeen, Australia, was found dead in his home, and the community was shocked. Nothing could prepare you for what you were about to see. Whatever had done this, it was obviously uh, a monster. The discoveries were the stuff nightmares are made of. Blood was everywhere, and Bryce himself was not only murdered, but skinned and partially cooked. When the police dared venture deeper into the house, they heard a weird out of place noise. Somebody was snoring. It was Catherine Knight, Price's partner. It didn't take the police long to determine they didn't need to look for suspects any further. The entire population of Aberdeen was there to testify. Nobody doubted that the perpetrator was none other than Knight herself. Catherine Knight showed no remorse and denied having any recollections of the night. However, this didn't stop her from pleading guilty, saving the jurors from the shockingly grisly details. The prosecution and the judge had to go through it all. After it was over, I, I didn't eat meat for about three months. To this day, the case remains unparalleled in Australia. No woman before or since has done anything approximating its brutality. Knight was the first female to get a life sentence without the possibility of parole. But before Knight did away with Price, she'd already had a long and prolific history of wrongdoings. All the red flags were right there in plain sight. How did it happen that the police and the community chose to ignore her persistent violent behavior that culminated in an unimaginably atrocious act? Let's take a closer look at the life of Australia's female Hannibal Lecter. A closer look at Catherine Knight's background reveals a troubled childhood, and that's putting it mildly. When she was born in 1955, it was the second marriage for her mother, Barbara Rowan, and barely a more successful one than the previous. Ken Knight, her new husband, was an alcoholic. Spousal rape and child abuse were ordinary things in the household. Barbara herself added to the fire, telling Catherine and her twin sister inappropriately intimate details about her sex life and how she hated both men and sex. When Catherine complained to her about the molestation she'd been enduring, she was told to put up with it and stop complaining. At school, Catherine Knight was known to be a wild child. She'd bully smaller kids and never hesitated to use her fists. In one instance, she went as far as to attack her teacher, who had to fight back and injured the girl in self-defense. On her better days, Kath seemed like an exemplary student and was commended for her good behavior. These mood swings were the early signs of Catherine's borderline personality disorder. Catherine left school without ever learning how to read or write at the age of 15. A year later, she got her dream job at a local abattoir. She was quickly promoted and given her own set of knives. Catherine was very proud of her work and loved her tools. Indeed, she loved the knives so much that one day she put them above her bed so that they would always be handy if I needed them. Four years later, Catherine married David Kellett, her co-worker at the abattoir. They both were heavy drinkers and on their wedding day, Kellett came to the service in a state of heavy intoxication, riding pillion on Catherine Knight's motorcycle. Kellett remembers Barbara, Catherine's mother, warning him that day. The old girl said to me, watch out. You better watch this one or she'll f***ing kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're f***ed. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll f***ing kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose. She's got a screw loose somewhere. It wasn't long before David got a taste of the other calf. On their wedding night, the bride wrapped her hands around her groom's neck and attempted to strangle him. Why? Catherine never forgot her mother telling her how she and her husband had intercourse seven times on their wedding night. With just three bouts, David simply didn't manage to perform in bed according to her standards. In Catherine's twisted mind, it was as bad as abandonment. And that's what she was like. If she didn't get her own way, if you crossed her, or if she imagined that you had, you know, done something or said something about her, she would get payback. One night, David was playing darts in a bar. The game protracted, and David got home a tad later, to be greeted with the sight of his burning clothes and a frying pan to his face. The blow was so vicious, it cracked the poor man's skull. David fled to the neighbors and collapsed. When back home from the hospital, he was greeted by the cath he loved, gentle and caring. David didn't press any charges, but the, the other cath was always just an eye blink away. On another occasion, David, a truck driver at the time, 
awoke in the early hours to find Kath sitting on his chest and grazing his throat with the tip of her favorite knife. You see how easy it is, she said, then cocked her head and asked, is it true that truck drivers have different women in every town? When Catherine gave birth to their daughter Melissa, it only got worse. Tired of the domestic abuse, David fled Aberdeen in May 1976. The next day, Catherine was seen walking the streets and violently throwing her pram from side to side, crashing it into fence posts. She was diagnosed with postnatal depression and treated at St. Elmo's Hospital for a couple of weeks. It didn't help. Once she was out, Catherine proceeded to put her two-month-old baby on railway tracks, steal an axe, and run the streets of Aberdeen, lashing at the passers-by. A local vagrant saved the child just minutes before the train's arrival, and Catherine Knight was arrested and, once again, taken to St. Elmo's Hospital. Knight signed herself out the following morning. Within the same week, she slashed a woman's face with one of her prized abattoir knives, took her prisoner, and forced her to drive her to Queensland to find Kellett. They stopped at a service station, and Knight proceeded to smash windows and attack the staff. In her mind, they aided Kellett's escape simply by repairing his car. Then Knight grabbed a boy and held him hostage before the police arrived and disarmed her with brooms. Knight confessed that she was going to kill the mechanics and then find and kill Kellett and his mother. Knight was admitted to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. Kellett caught wind of her hardships and, despite all the abuse, ran to his wife's aid. In August 1976, she was released into his care. Their relationship finally crumbled to dust in 1984 when Knight left Kellett for another man. The following relationships with David Saunders and John Chillingworth proceeded in a similar fashion. Saunders got hit with a frying pan, stabbed into his abdomen, and saw Knight kill his dingo puppy before his very eyes. Chillingworth was smacked across the face so hard, the blow knocked off his glasses and shattered his false teeth. He went out and cut his dog's throat. Was the dog dead? It was a clean cut, they said. The transgressions were serious enough to earn her years of incarceration. So how come Catherine wasn't locked up for good? It said the locals were well aware of the danger she posed, but wrote her antics off as crazy Kath being herself. Just like her partners, they got used to her explosive behavior. The men of Catherine Knight were known to be kind people. At the same time, they were hard-working, hard-drinking, tough-as-nails folk. They confided in their friends about the abuse, but going to authorities would be as good as admitting to their weaknesses and doing so publicly. Instead, the men preferred to put up with it and stop complaining. I never raised a finger against her, not even in self-defense. I would just walk away. In 1995, Catherine Knight found another object of affection. By that time, she'd retired from the abattoir work because of an injury but compensated with redecorating her Aberdeen house with skulls, bones, pelts, pitchforks, and other sharp objects, like a scythe hanging from the ceiling of her living room. Visitors remember the house being a dark and foreboding place, not unlike the creepy house from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. John Pricey Price was well aware of Catherine's explosive behavior. He was a heavy drinker, but also a diligent worker, a father of three, and a man well loved in his community. A terrific bloke, just as Kathy liked him. On top of that, John's children adored her, and he made a lot of money working at the local mines. John was more cautious than his predecessors and didn't let Catherine move in with him. She'd spend three nights a week at his house and then return home. John's friends watched their relationship unfold with a growing sense of unease. It wasn't long before the fights got physical too. The bad Kath was there to raise hell, and the good Kath returned just in time to mend the damage. Time went by, and Catherine believed their relationship was serious enough for them to tie the knot. John was separated from his wife, but they were still officially married, and he was in no rush to deal with the papers. In 1998, Catherine went berserk over another refusal to get married and decided to pay John back. She filmed the expired first aid kits John had salvaged at work and sent the video to his boss, accusing Pricey of theft. He was promptly fired from the job he'd had for the past 17 years. Pricey kicked Catherine out and his friends breathed a sigh of relief. However, the two couldn't stay away from each other and then a few months, they were together again. In February 2000, Knight's attacks on Price culminated with a stab to his chest once again, the man didn't press any charges. Price's neighbors remember how he asked to let him in one night and said, 
She's gone for the butcher's knife, so I got out of there. One of those evenings, John called the police. He couldn't make Knight leave his house. There was information from uh, her brother that she did say those particular words, that she would kill Pricey, and um, she'd get away with it because they'd think she was mad. There was other comments, um, uh, if Pricey takes me back, uh, he takes me back till the death. John Price's friend, Trevor Lewis, remembers how he heard Knight say to Pricey, you'll never get me out of this house, I'll do you in first. Even scarier is how Pricey seemed to know his fate. If you see my truck parked outside my house past 6am, it'd mean I'm dead, he told his neighbour. On February 29, he took out a restraining order against Knight. When he arrived at work, he confided in his superiors that he thought his woman was going to kill him. They suggested he shouldn't come back home that night, but Pricey was afraid of what Knight might do to his children if he wasn't there. And there was plenty to be suspicious of. Not only Pricey, but Knight's own daughter, Natasha, got alarmed when, on the same February day, Catherine invited her for dinner in a Chinese restaurant. Observing something particularly disturbing in her mother's behavior, Natasha said, I hope you're not going to kill Pricey and yourself. Knight proceeded to buy sexy underwear and go to Pricey's place. When she entered his house at 11am, the man was sound asleep. As soon as Good Calf had sex with John, Bad Calf was there to take over. When John fell asleep, the woman whipped out her butcher's knife. After she was done with Price, Knight gulped a concoction of pills in a half-hearted suicide attempt. She left the following note to justify her actions. Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. You to Beck for Ross, for little John. Now play with little John's dick, John Price. A look into the matter proved the accusations groundless. When Knight came back to her senses, she denied knowing anything about the murder. I don't remember anything. Instead, she painted a colorful picture of John Price, the abuser, something she'd done before with her previous partners. During her trial, Knight stared in front of her impassively, but went into a fit at the prosecution's description of the crime scene. Knight was following her plan. She'd been put into mental hospitals before, big deal, but the diagnosis proved to be a borderline personality disorder. Which is not a psychiatric illness, it's actually just, it's a disorder of the way you relate to other people and that's what she was like. If she didn't get her own way, if you crossed her or if she imagined that you had, you know, done something or said something about her, she would get payback. Another deviation from the norm was Knight's morbid fascination with knives, how she kept them above her bed and sometimes used on her lovers. It points to pickerism which is characterized by sexual interest in penetrating the skin of another person with sharp objects and is a well-documented form of paraphilia. Knight was ruled sane and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. On top of that, Judge O'Keefe ordered the papers on her case never to be released simply because of the extremely disturbing nature of the case. Knight spends her days behind bars at Silverwater Women's Correctional Center, Australia's meanest women's prison. No one on the outside is the Black Knight and female Hannibal Lecter. In prison, Catherine is called simply the Nana. She's considered a model prisoner. Was Knight so shocked by her own doing she locked Bad Cath away for good? Or was it only men that brought it out in her? Whatever it is, she's not telling. Knight has never opened up about the murder and her motives. As far as the judicial system is concerned, it's unnecessary. To sentence any person to life imprisonment is a big thing. To sentence a woman to life imprisonment, for me, was an even bigger thing. This was as bad a case as you got, so she had to go to jail for the term of her life.